It's the day before Christmas break for most people in the affluent area of Upper Marion Township, Pennsylvania, when Raphael Robb, a professor at the University of Pennsylvania, returns from morning errands to discover his wife, Ellen, in a pool of blood. He calls police. There's no audio of the call, but in a transcript released by the Upper Marion Police Department, Raphael states, Hello, yeah, I just came home and found my wife murdered on the kitchen floor. The officer responding, she's killed? Yes. How can you tell? I know, her head is cracked. Is there anyone in the house? There is a broken window in the back. Okay, stay out front. There are police and an ambulance coming. In minutes, police arrive and cordon off the area. Inside, it appears that housewife and mother Ellen Robb was wrapping up last-minute holiday gifts in the kitchen. She had been seated at a kitchen table, oddly facing the wall. Ellen never sees it coming. A shotgun blast to the face. Experienced detectives would initially see a wound or a series of wounds like that and think shotgun blast. Next, CSI moves in and documents the bloodbath, every grisly angle captured. The photos that we saw in this case pale in the comparison that anything we've ever seen. We have seen horrendous accidents, people being hit by train, people being eaten alive by animals, and these photos were the worst we've ever seen. There was a lot of blood around where her body was found, mostly at the head area. Police speak with Ellen's husband, Raphael. They ask him where he was during the morning hours his wife was viciously murdered. Raphael explains he took his 12-year-old daughter, Olivia, to school, stopped at a local grocery store, then dropped off his grades at the University of Pennsylvania before returning home to find his wife. He was away during the time when Ellen probably was killed. Investigators pull surveillance footage of his various stops. Raphael's alibi appears to check out. Detectives continue to search the home looking for clues. That's when they spot shards of glass by a back door. Somebody had broken glass, and it was one of those doors where with a broken pane of glass, a burglar could reach in and unlock a door. Right away, investigators theorize... It must have been a burglary that occurred there. And the motive for murder? The victim's going to identify the, uh, the perpetrator. It seems like an open and shut case. Then, as police continue to collect evidence and piece together what happened, Ellen's brother Gary arrives. He's there to pick up his sister for the holidays. As I drove up to the house, I saw the house quarantined with the police tape, jumped out of my car, and quickly learned that she had been killed. It's devastating news for Gary. Ellen is more than a sister. She's like a second mother to him. When she was in college, she worked three jobs and sent her earnings home to my mother so that she could support my brother and myself while she raised us as a single parent. And now, sadly, she's gone. I saw them put her lifeless body in the ambulance. The timing couldn't be more tragic. She was, uh, she was going to come up to Boston to celebrate her 50th birthday, to celebrate Christmas with her daughter and, and our family. Then, in front of a swarm of black and whites, a yellow school bus pulls up. It's Raphael and Ellen's 12-year-old daughter, Olivia. She comes home to see her house surrounded with police tape, flashing lights everywhere, policemen, ambulance. She gets out, walks up to her house, and a 12-year-old girl says, I live here. Gary sends his niece to a neighbor's house while he tries to comprehend the tragedy unfolding in front of his eyes. Immediately, thoughts run through your mind as to how could this possibly happen. You're in a most peaceful, beautiful suburban neighborhood outside of Philadelphia. Murders and killings of this nature just don't occur in that section of suburban Philadelphia. Authorities continue to investigate the case as a burglary gone horribly wrong. And now they can't help but wonder if there's a murderer on the loose looking to rob housewives alone in their homes. The only problem is that Ellen wasn't alone. There was a little dog there, and animals invariably walk in the blood and trample blood prints all over the place. But the dog was locked in a bedroom. Who does that? No burglar would do that. And there's something else that's troublesome for detectives. The broken window pane on the door where the burglar allegedly gained entry. None of the glass is crushed beneath where the killer would have walked. 
And it's not just contradictory evidence on the floor. It's on the ceiling, too. The way the blood cast off had been found on various patterns, especially on the ceiling. Detectives believe the blood spatter patterns don't match up with a shotgun blast to the face. The blood splatter that was uh, particularly critical. And it's not long before their suspicions are confirmed when Ellen's x-rays come back from the morgue. And the results? X-rays had shown that it was not a gunshot wound. It had been a blunt force trauma injury. It immediately changes the focus of the type of person that you're looking for. 49-year-old wife and mother Ellen Robb is beaten to death inside her upscale Pennsylvania home. Ellen Robb's face was obliterated. How could this possibly happen? Now that police have ruled out a burglary gone wrong, they start to believe the murder is an inside job. I cannot tell you how many murders I did in my career where the person, the last person to see somebody alive and the first person to see him dead is the killer. And in this case, that person is Ellen's husband, Raphael Robb. Coincidence? It was apparent pretty quickly that he did have a motive. When police interview Ellen's brother, they find out Ellen didn't die on just any day. It was the day. The day that Ellen was struck down and killed brutally, the most horrific bludgeoning in the history of Montgomery County, Pennsylvania, in over a half a century, was the day she was to have her own emancipation. That's right, Ellen was leaving Raphael, and Gary was on his way to take his sister and her daughter, Olivia, to Boston. He clearly understood that she was leaving, and it was at that point of her freedom that he struck her down and killed her. According to Ellen's brother, she planned to divorce Raphael after years of verbal, mental, and more recently, physical abuse began. But if Raphael has the motive to kill Ellen, what about his seemingly solid alibi? Ends up, just like his wife's murder, the alibi is overkill. He would be in places where, there, where he knows that there would be surveillance video. Detectives claim at this local Wawa convenience store, he stood in front of a surveillance camera for several minutes and for seemingly no reason while he drank an entire soda. So amateurish as to be laughable. It was creating a series of places that he had gone that would be plausibly linked together. But there's just one problem. It was not in conformity with what we thought the timeline was. Now making it possible that Raphael is at home during the time his wife is ruthlessly slaughtered. And according to investigators, evidence found at the house points to Raphael as the true killer. First up, the dog. He intentionally locked the dog away before he went to do the killing. And no burglar would do that. Second, the door where the supposed burglar made entry. It actually looked to me like it had been broken from the inside out. And third, the coroner's finding that Ellen is killed by blunt force trauma. When a killer uses a blunt force object to commit a killing and strikes repeatedly, it, once blood begins to flow from the victim, it gets on the, the weapon. And every time the killer raises and lowers it, that blood splatters someplace. According to authorities, a beating like this one is up close and very personal. Somebody who has a reason to want this person to be dead. While investigators zero in on Raphael, they lack one crucial piece of the puzzle, the murder weapon. We had actually been told by the pathologist to look for a long cylindrical object. A murder weapon is never recovered. Still, prosecutors move ahead with their case. I arrested him and charged him with first degree murder. But there's just one problem, and it's about to turn this case on its head. District Attorney Bruce Castor doesn't believe Raphael is a cold-blooded killer. I didn't think that that's what fit the evidence. I had a written report from two psychiatrists telling me that this was a rage killing, a rage killing where the killer strikes more blows with more force, far more than is necessary to bring, bring about death. That tells us the type of mindset of the person that we're looking for. Meaning, Raphael killed his wife, but in a sudden loss of control versus a premeditated action. DA Castor claims it's a crime of passion brought on by a triggering event. In this case, he believes it's a conversation about Ellen's plans to leave Raphael. He has a complete freak out, grabs the nearest thing that's capable of producing death, and then goes to town on her head. But unless he admits he did it, then I don't have any choice but to put on the evidence that I do have. 
For the next 11 months, Rafael sits in jail on murder one charges, facing life in prison and possibly the death penalty. He swears he's innocent. Now I have a problem because I can't actually go and try to convince a jury that it's a first degree case when I actually think it's a voluntary manslaughter case. But then just before Rafael's case is set to go to trial, this bombshell. He cops to the brutal slaying of his wife. Unbelievable. Rafael admits to prosecutors that he beat his wife's face in with a nearby chin-up bar. That he staged the break-in and disposed of the weapon and bloody clothes in a dumpster in Chinatown. In his words, he just lost it when he learned Ellen planned to take their daughter to Massachusetts. Facts that, that developed fit the forensics. But Rafael's confession is a game changer for the state's case against him. It no longer is a provable first degree murder case in my judgment. Because remember, you're, it's proof beyond a reasonable doubt. And prosecutors believe a crime of passion or a rage killing creates enough doubt to derail a first degree murder conviction, which requires proof of premeditation. The district attorney, he stated there was a lot of circumstantial evidence no murder weapon was found, um, and uh, that he felt that it would give the family peace uh, to accept a plea deal. As part of a negotiated plea deal, Rafael pleads guilty to a voluntary manslaughter charge, which carries a maximum sentence of 20 years. But in a shocking decision by the court, the judge sentences Rafael Robb to a lesser sentence of just 10 years. And get this, Raphael has a chance of parole after only five years. How could this possibly happen? Ellen's family is horrified by the verdict. We had no understanding of the legal system as it related to manslaughter versus murder. That the sentence guidelines could be as low as two to five years for manslaughter. I argued that the facts and circumstances warranted the maximum sentence of 20 years. The judge didn't agree and imposed the 10-year term. I didn't expect him to do that. But it did happen, and now Ellen's family has to live with the verdict and live without their loved one. Our family without Ellen is, um, is not complete. We're not whole, and we never will be. Then five years pass, and just as Ellen's family feared, he was paroled. You heard right. Raphael Robb is a free man after just five years behind bars. It's remarkable to think that after serving only five of a five to 10 year sentence, he was actually paroled by the Pennsylvania Parole Board. It's very, very troubling. But Ellen's brother is determined that Raphael serves the full 10 years. We decided to fight it because it was an outrage not only to our family, but to all victims of domestic violence and abuse. And in an unprecedented and historic move, the parole board makes an announcement. And my message to Mr. Robb is that this is the captain speaking, and your flight to freedom has been canceled. And the first time in the history of Pennsylvania, parole was rescinded for a violent offender, and rightfully so. That's correct. Raphael Robb is suddenly heading back to prison to finish out his full 10-year sentence. But Ellen's family is just getting started. After admitting to killing his wife in a fit of passion, Raphael Robb is charged with voluntary manslaughter and sentenced to 10 years for the brutal killing of his wife, Ellen. After serving the full 10, Robb was released from prison just this past January. Ellen's family says, hold on. He can't simply go back into society unfettered while this, the memory of my sister fades away. Ellen is serving a lifetime sentence in the grave that we all share, and he is out free. It's very, very troubling. Outraged by the light sentence, Ellen's family wants justice and moves ahead with their wrongful death lawsuit filed during Raphael's attempt at a five-year parole. In looking back at the plea deal today and the fact that Rob only served a five to 10 year sentence, it weighs heavily on the family. Ellen's family hires attorneys Andrew Duffy and Robert Mangaluzzi to represent their civil case. The family talked to us and they asked us to prove what they believe could be proved and that, that this, this was a premeditated murder. And after reviewing the evidence, they think they have a strong case. Anybody who 
did this to any human being, let alone his wonderful wife and mother of his only child, should spend every second of their life in jail for the rest of their life. The plaintiff's attorneys break down the evidence that they presented to a civil jury. They start at the beginning, Raphael's phone call to police. Raphael Robb uh, did not call 911. That's right, he called the direct police line. And why is that significant? He wanted uh, to set up his alibi. He didn't want to be recorded. Uh, he would have known that 911 would record his call. Another thing they say points to premeditation, the complete lack of blood evidence found on Raphael. Attorneys Duffy and Mangaluzzi argue, how in the world would that be possible in the middle of such a bloodbath? Um, he claimed that somehow after the murder in this slaughterhouse, that he took off his shirt, his pants, his socks, and his shoes, somehow hopped across the blood-spattered floor to the hallway, went upstairs, found baby wipes, cleaned himself up, changed into clothes without a, s a drop of blood. It was incredible, implausible, and an absolute lie. They have their own theory to explain the lack of blood on Raphael and its explosive new evidence. He uh, had a Tyvek suit. Police found an additional Tyvek suit, a hazmat suit uh, in his BMW. Make that two hazmat style suits, according to the plaintiff's attorneys. One suit used in the murder and the other a backup suit he forgot to discard with the other evidence. If Raphael Robb was a chemist, if he worked at an industrial plant, he would have a potential justification for having a Tyvek suit in his BMW. Raphael Robb was a professor of economics at the University of Pennsylvania. There was no rhyme or reason why he would have a Tyvek suit in the back of his BMW. Attorneys Duffy and Mangaluzzi claim it's the most reasonable explanation for why there wasn't any blood on Raphael. We proved that the blood trail stopped abruptly in the garage. And that only means that a Tyvek suit was on, was taken off, was discarded. So the only thing left after the Tyvek suit was taken off was a blood-free murder. Then there's the issue of the murder weapon, which was never recovered. Raphael Robb claims that uh, he began to argue with Alan. He grabbed a chin-up bar and that he beat her to death with it. Those wounds uh, that were found on Alan Gregory Robb were sharp, lacerating wounds. They are consistent with a sharp object such as a crowbar and not a round chin-up bar. Then they enter into evidence, pictures of the Rob's garage and the tools. We had a picture of all the tools lined up and a crowbar happened to be missing. The physical facts pointed that this was not a, a chin-up bar. This was absolutely a jagged edged instrument such as a crowbar which the plaintiff's attorneys argue means he had to go find the weapon. It wasn't just nearby and grabbed in a fit of rage. It shows pre-thought and planning on Raphael's part. Also, they claim a crowbar-type weapon better explains the horrific damage done to Ellen's head. I will never be able to get those photos out of my mind. Ellen was unidentifiable. He had literally beaten her face in to remove her identity. The civil trial lawyers then point to something obvious, Raphael Robb's job at the University of Pennsylvania. He's an economics professor who specializes in, get this, game theory. It's the science of logical decision making involving strategic thinking and planning. People who are proficient in game theory plan things out, they have backup plans. In plain terms, this was a premeditated murder. He had it all planned out, but he didn't plan for his story unraveling so quickly. Then they introduce a letter written by Raphael to his daughter, Olivia, two years after the murder. This is the letter that, in hindsight, was the single most important piece of evidence at the civil trial. In the letter, Raphael is asking for photos of his daughter and the two of them together. He's hoping to show that he's a good father in order to receive a lighter punishment during the sentencing phase. In exchange, he promises to send her Christmas gifts 
and money. He goes on, I'd hate to delay sending you the gift, but I won't do so unless I get these items. Won't the love of money propel you into action? Love and kisses, Dad, XO, XO, XO. And with all this damning evidence, the civil trial kicks off, and attorney Mongaluzzi comes out swinging in his opening remarks. In civil court transcripts, he states, You are a killer and a liar, Mr. Rob, aren't you? Raphael responds, Killer, yes. Liar, too. Yes. Also, this stunning courtroom exchange, where it appears Raphael is blaming his wife for her own murder. It goes like this. Raphael says, My wife pushed me. Mangaluzzi. So you're claiming to this jury that Ellen provoked you into murdering her, is that right? Raphael responds, she pushed me. I got angry. I lost my faculties. That's what happened. Then the biggest moment arrives, and the plaintiff's attorneys call their star witness. The doors open up. She walks up to the stand, and the jury doesn't see a 12-year-old girl anymore. Now they see a 20-year-old young lady. It's Olivia. This is the first time she's seen her father, Raphael, since that fateful day eight years before. It was the most emotional, dramatic event that may have been witnessed in any courtroom anywhere. Olivia's testimony is documented in court transcripts. A portion of her testimony reads this way. Attorney Duffy says, Olivia, before your father took your mother from you, did you fear your father? Olivia responds, yes. Attorney Duffy, why? Olivia, my father could just lose his temper really rapidly and quickly. Olivia testified that, and ended her testimony with, the thing that disappoints her most when she meets new people is that those new people don't get to meet her mother. The civil trial ends, and the attorneys for Ellen's estate rest. We proved that Raphael Robb uh, intentionally and with premeditation murdered his wife. This was no crime of passion. And the jury agrees, awarding the largest civil suit payout in Pennsylvania history. $124 million. Despite all the evidence in the civil trial, Raphael Robb is out of prison. Yes, living as a free man, he walked out from behind bars in January of 2017 after serving his full 10-year sentence for manslaughter. And while Rob can never be tried a second time for murder, Ellen's family has decided to turn their tragedy into triumph. They create the foundation Every Great Reason, an acronym for Ellen's initial. We have passionately worked for nearly a decade to achieve many goals on behalf of victims of domestic violence and abuse. Most notably, creating Ellen's Law, which allows victims to meet with the parole board prior to any prisoner's release and helping others is bringing some solace to Ellen's family. But they're still learning to live with the loss. When she walked in, she would light up a room and she would do so uh, in a way that was not centered on herself, but on, all, <laughs> excuse me, but on all of those around her. Just uh, an amazing individual. Tragically taken by the hands of a monster. He slaughtered his wife as something out of a horror movie. And in a horror movie, there is always a monster. And the monster here was Raphael Robb. <laughs>